few moments here this morning, I'd like you to take your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. You know, last week, last Sunday, we basically looked at a study that came or comes about through a question. Christmas, what does it mean? Obviously, we can talk about a lot of things in regard to Christmas, you know, and it, it's none of the secular things. I, I realize we as a church understand that. It's not of the secular things that we look. You know, when Jesus was born, that's a controversy even to this day, when it took place. Was it in December? Was it in March? Was it some other time in the year? That's not the point. The point is, he came. He came. He was born among men. He walked among men. He taught. He died. He rose again. Brought eternal life. Chapter 18 in Matthew. I'd like to read a few verses here. We're going to talk about a couple things. Verse 11 starts and says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. I might ask the question this way. I'll, I'll read the text as it's written in King James. How think ye? Or what do you think? If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them go astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine and go into the mountains and seeks that which has gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine that when not astray. Even so, it is not the will of the Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him uh, his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall not hear thee, then, if, if he shall hear thee, then thou hast gained the brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take the one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen or a publican. That seems a bit harsh, but truly that is God's word. Verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say un, unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. If my Father, of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. May the Lord have blessings to reading of his word here today. Wherever two or more are gathered together, two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Do <coughs> you think the Lord was here Friday night? There was more than two, wasn't there? <laughs> you know, a man by the name of Dr. A.J. Gordon, he was a famous preacher in the 19th century. He wrote an autobiography, How Christ Came to the Church. In the introduction, Dr. Gordon relates how that on a Sunday night, wearied from the work of preaching, I'm, prepare, I'm sorry, preparing for the next day's sermon, he fell asleep. He had a dream. He was in the pulpit before a large congregation, ready to begin his sermon, when a stranger entered, and he passed slowly up the left aisle of the church, looking first to one side and then the other, as though silently asking with his eyes, can I sit here? Dr. Gordon made a mental note 
of the presence of this visitor. And he was determined at the conclusion of the message of the service that he was going to make his way over to meet this, this new visitor. After the benediction had been given, the congregation began to depart. The aisles filled with many people, but he lost sight of the stranger that was there. The stranger disappeared in the crowd. Dr. Gordon approached the man who happened to have been sitting next to the stranger that was there. He asked, can you tell me who the stranger was who sat in the pew next to you this morning? In the most matter-of-fact way, this man replied to Dr. Gordon, why? Didn't you know him? It was Jesus of Nazareth. With a silence of the keenest disappointment, he said, My dear sir, why didn't you let me know? Because I wanted to meet him. And with the same casual air, the gentleman replied, Oh, do not be troubled. He was here today, and he will come again. Amen. The rest of his book explains and applies the tremendous truth that draw upon the mind of the reader and penetrate the heart, just as this dream has touched his pastor. He realized for the first time in his life, think of this, this is a minister, this is a pastor. For the first time in his life, that we have a promise. We have a promise of the visitation of the Lord Jesus Christ into our life. You know, what we came together here for on Friday evening was a celebration of Christmas and Christmas Eve. A candlelight service. A lighting of light. In the scene or the program that we had, we talked about the manger. We talked about the cross. Both are vivid symbols of the coming of Christ and the death of Christ. Dr. Gordon's ministry experienced a spiritual revolution. You know, sometimes it takes an awakening in someone's life like that to bring us to where we need to be. We should have been all along. You know, I have said over the past few weeks here, the growth that has taken place in our church is something that we have prayed about, we've thought about. You know, as much as I might say it, I don't want you to think this all wrong, sometimes we jokingly say, well, you know, we can only hold so many anyhow. But you know, we can get as many in as we're willing to let in. Now, I mean that as far as the facility goes. But God has not closed the door on the number of people that can come unto Him, has He? The significance of the text that we read here from today in regard to the illustration in the sheep. You know, I for one think there's something special in regard to the number 100. I'm going to express my belief. I believe to do it right, one minister can only faithfully and in a special way of blessing can handle 100 members. Yes, I realize there's churches that are far beyond that, but you know, they do have other associates, individuals. You know, there are deacons, there are those that are organized there to take care of a certain number of people within the flock. There is something to be said about that. But there's not a one that should be lost along the way. Our focus, you know, whether it be a minister, whether it be a parishioner, whether it be an elder, whether it be a deacon, we are all to be focused on bringing that flock together, keeping it 
in the love of Christ. But sometimes it does take a Christmas Eve service to burst onto the scene that says God is still in control. He can fill this church. Honestly, I came Friday night with an expectation. Did you? Yeah, I realized we came to have candlelight service. Let me ask you again, coming here today, did you come with an expectation? Do you come to church expecting a visitation of Jesus Christ? We are in a gathering here. I realize the people make up the church. It's not the building. But when we come together, the experience of joining ourselves in that relationship with Christ should excite us that it spills out beyond these four walls. I guess that's what stirred me so with Friday night. It was you. It was the communication that went out. These things need to take place. We need to be expecting when we share the love of Christ that God in turn is going to bless us with his presence. You know, in chapter 28 of Matthew, there's a few verses there at the close of that chapter that I'm, I'm sure we'll, what we are well aware of. But Jesus came and he spoke with his handful of followers that he had worked with for now over three years, spent a lot of time with. They experienced a lot, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of difficult times, a lot of things that they just didn't quite understand. But as Jesus was about to leave them, these 11 disciples, Eleven disciples went into Galilee, it says in verse 16, onto a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. <coughs> and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But there were still some doubters. There was still some who doubted. But Jesus came and he spoke to them. And he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, this is the part I love. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We're not alone, are we? We're not alone. You know, I spoke to you a while ago in regard to a lonely soul that I see kneeling next to a gravestone. It's like in your mind, you can almost see the Lord standing next to that person with his hand on their shoulder. How many of us have been through a difficult time? And we felt such a warmth or a closeness of of a presence that we can't explain. Oh, I believe you may call me crazy. You may be, be ready to run me out of here after I make this statement. I believe in angelic presences even in this time that we live today. I believe angels are with us. Praise God, praise God. I believe angels are with us. Hallelujah. I believe God visits us in the person of his son from time to time that we just don't understand. These apostles experienced a living presence. We experience it in a spiritual presence. John describes something in the book of Revelation. In the opening verses, 
chapter 1. He says, I saw, this begins in verse 12, I saw seven candlesticks, and in the midst of these seven candlesticks, one, like the Son of Man. And we lit candles here Friday evening. Candlelight service has always been special time for the church. But the thing that we need to grasp the most, God is always with us. We're never alone. You know, if we were to take time, and we did that a few years ago, we might do it sometime down the road here, not too distant. If we study the seven churches in Revelations, there are special words of commendation that is expressed to these churches. Christ will commend those who are walking worthy in that spiritual life, who are involved in daily service. But we need to make ourselves sensitive to allow the Spirit to work through us. <clears throat> what could he commend in our life today? What have we done in the last week, two weeks, that we could be commended for? I believe, I believe we witnessed some of that, in fact, in how we saw the turnout on Friday evening. People were working. People were sharing. Messages were getting out there. Tim did a, a promo that was actually put out on YouTube, some of the things that were done that just allows maybe someone who's never been inside this, this church at 601 Opossum Lake Road. Let me share something with you. The program that we did here on Friday evening, I had actually emailed the man that put that together. I wanted to make sure. I mean, he had a he had a note at the end of his message saying, if you can use this in any way, please feel free. I mean, it was already there, but I just wanted to make sure. Shot a message out to him. Did not hear anything back till this morning. He wanted to know how it went. I think it's great when we communicate the things of God. You know, we've been blessed by so many tools that we can do great things today. There are so many gifted people with talents. We have that in our own church here. We've experienced some of it. What took place, and I don't, I don't mean to single anybody out or put anybody in the spot, but I mentioned Ken and I communicating some things here early on and how everything came together Friday evening. I talked to Sharon here a bit ago because the kids brought me a Christmas gift, very special Christmas gift here this morning. I know there's people that have great talents that do great things. You know, whether it is the trade that we're in, the types of things we do, these things are important. We can do great things. All of us are gifted in some way to give something to someone else. So what could you be commended for here today in service of the Lord? Could he commend our attitude towards our fellow man, towards our brothers and sisters? Could he commend our actions, how we live, how we act in the workplace? We need to know that we are always being watched. Christ is always present. We always have our Lord present. And he will convict. Have you ever felt the convicting hand of God? You say, well, you know, we don't literally feel his hand. You know, sometimes it hurts worse than a hand. Have you ever been spanked? 
Oh, we have some in here that need discipline to. <laughs> I've been there. But you know, our Lord does bring discipline in our lives. And we need to understand He's doing it for our best interests. So why do we shy away from correction coming our way? Sometimes we think God only steps in to, to be, hey, maybe what we might call a killjoy, to, to steal our joy. Some see him maybe more as a, a kind of law enforcement person, a policeman, someone who wants to catch you, to trap you in some way, doing something that you shouldn't do. The thing we need to understand, that our God, the creator of humanity, perfect in every way, has a love for sinners. And we can go back to John 3.16 again. God so loved that he gave. We can't earn it. We have to receive it. It's a free and a willing gift. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. You know, peace-loving people, we might say, are against war. But you know, evil desires to destroy. So we as peace-loving people, in the name of Christ, should be taking offensive in regard to evil today. Doctors are sworn to fight disease. Hopefully help bring about healing and recovery. God would not be God if he was not against evil. When God forbids something, he does it with the best interest of us in mind. He has our best interest in mind. So it is through that that Christ brings conviction when we step out of line, when we are doing things that we're not supposed to do and we feel guilty, rightly so. But he's trying to get us to correct our actions. But there are those today that continue to resist what God wants to bring about for good in our lives. Christ is always present. He's always present with us. He's always present to bring guidance, direction, and counsel into our lives. You know, coming back to Revelations again, talking about the seven churches, there is a reoccurring frame in those particular texts that we can read. And it is, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that has an ear. Do we have our spiritual ears open today? You know, throughout the writings of God's word, God's word, throughout the epistles, there are specific instructions given to us as individuals, given to the churches. There is a need for the worldly change to take place in a Christian's life. As we come together in the church, we come together to worship, we come together to witness, we come together to pray, we come together to praise. Christ is here. Christ is here. He's with us. He will counsel us. He will direct us. He will build and grow our character into what he desires for us to be, that we might be more like him. He gave us counsel concerning companions, Raising families. Opportunities. Responsibilities. He helps us in all these areas. He gave us counsel concerning choices, conduct. We might even say our professional careers. <coughs> all these things have provided. provided. But Christ is present for us today to help us find comfort, 
find peace, and find joy. I mean, obviously, we talk a lot about that in the Christmas season. Over and over again, the Lord counseled his disciples to have faith rather than fear. Do not surrender to those things that can destroy, but have faith in the power of Christ. He convinced them that the life of faith is truly the victory. Do we have faith in Jesus Christ today? Not only did our Savior bring courage, he brought confidence. He brought cheer into the hearts of his disciples. They faced life head on. We faced life head on. He's giving us, just like he gave them, comfort, hope, as we face the greatest fear of all. And that's death. By his resurrection from the dead, he assured us that for the believer, death is not the end. Do we believe that today? Collectively, do we believe that to die in Christ is life eternal? He gave to them a demonstration of that reality. He gave that directly to them, and he's giving it to us today. So I'm going to wrap this up with the promises that we read in God's Word. With the Lord from time to time even being present with us, whether you feel that, that strong, compelling drive within, or whether you feel that touch upon the shoulder as you kneel, heavy in grief in some situation. He's promised to be with us. He's promised to be with us all the way throughout our days if we're willing to walk hand in hand with him. He will be with us in the days of the beautiful sunshine that we experienced here this morning. How many were up early to see the sun begin to rise? How many maybe were outside and it almost seemed like a beautiful spring morning? Now they're calling for some bad weather tomorrow. <laughs> but we have a God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that's walking with us sunshine even in the times of shadows he will be with us in times of weakness to give us strength that we may face another day he will be with us in the battles that we face now you may say, well, I'm not going to war. Well, it doesn't have to be to war. The spiritual battles we face sometimes are greater than war. Do we realize that we can be brought to physical sickness if we allow our bodies to submit to the deception of the enemy? Worry can affect you physically, right? It can destroy you if it's left unchecked. Our Lord has created a promise, to, of a, gave us a promise of an abiding presence. He's designed it in a way that through the compliance of each and every one of us, he's as near as he, we want him to be. He is given to us, he was given to us to provide an incentive to continue to walk to straight and narrow. Are we walking the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ today? We're here today because of the love of Christ. He came as a baby, walked among us, died, shed his blood, that we might have the remission of sins. All we have to do is claim it. So I hope each and every one of us in here today knows what Jesus means to us what Christmas truly means to us. It's Jesus. He says in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Let's stand together.
Lord, I say thank you for your abiding presence that you have brought into this church family. I know there are those today, Lord, that are away from us here. Some are feeling the effects of a physical infirmity. Some today, Lord, who have responsibilities and obligations. Some that are traveling. Some that are still visiting with family. But Lord, I pray wherever they are right now, Lord, that you might be with all of us. Lord, that we might know the peace, the love, and the joy that comes in knowing you. Lord, this week ahead, I pray that we again might be out and about doing the things that we've been called to do. Yes, responsibilities of jobs, caring for families, taking care of the things that we need to do. But I believe we have been commissioned with a responsibility to share the good news, to preach the word, to teach the truth, that many more may walk in the light. Lord, I pray that the spirit of Christmas, the glorious light and joy that you bring, will ring loud and clear every day that we live. In your precious name we pray. Amen.